What is the exact title? Is it intuition? What, I forgot the exact term. Your thing, man. I know. <laughs> That's right. It's it's intuition. Intuition. intuition, instinct versus implementation, and that you needed to do both. Okay, there you go. Instinct versus. All right. In, so with I. Because uh, I, I remember the term instinct coming up and me being uncomfortable with it and me wanting it to be intuition, but I didn't want to inscribe. But in any case, um, so there's two, these are the last two conversations be, uh, between a Twix, Eric, and me. Thank you. And. Um, before I get into my talk, um, let me just make a few uh, dumb comments about requirements for students. And that is, the same procedures will occur this term as last term. You will, take, you will come to the two sessions. Um, in this particular term, you'll ha you have a book if you're signed up for the course or credit. You have a book to be reading, which you're reading right now. Ben is also conducting a set of seminars about the book. Um, there will be a final exam, and on that exam, the exam will be structured very much like the final exam last term. There'll be a set of questions based on the sessions, and in this case, also based on Ben's seminar and the readings from that book, and that will constitute your final grade, and that is that does constitute the entire course. And sometime before that last final exam, I will be finishing the syllabi, which will say you have to come to all of these classes, <laughs> you have to read that book, you have to go to Ben's syllabi, and you have to take these tests. And I don't know why it's so hard and I just write down what I say, but I got this big form on the syllabi I'm supposed to fill out and it's intimidating. So, now, uh, I have a slight presentation to make today, and then Eric will make his. Uh, this is an important day for me because intuition or instincts relates very much to what I think to be Eric's um, peculiar uh, philosophy. It's not, it's, it's, you know, we started with a personal philosophy, and when you start to think of, talk about instincts, you're talking about how an artist or an, intell or an intellectual or any, any person, any individual, operates in the world uh, with an agency that he or she does not actually know that they are operating for. Um, and it's becomes, it's in, one of the most incredibly interesting uh, aspects of human life and probably life as such. Um, and the thing that I think makes it important and interesting to me about Eric is that Eric has understood it to be and generalized it into a political principle. Um, and I've tried to theorize it and t talk about it as the adequacy of the self. It's generally disparaged. It's disparaged as a philosophical idea as being solipsistic or infantile. Uh, and Eric's attitude about it is certainly neither of those because his attitude about it and, the, and a philosophical ad about it understands two parts of it. One is that there is such a thing as a self and that there's instincts associated with the self, but the, but the other part of it and the part that's so important to understand is that, that there is no such thing as an isolated, solipsistic, adequate self. That the self is always in communication with and in construction with uh, a community of operations and a set of and a, and a larger set of forces, and so this becomes a very interesting thing to consider. So when you're acting out of instincts, you're not acting personally. Let's put it that way, but you're acting individually in a way that no other instrument, no other agency for those instincts could ever act. And so. This idea, I think, is a really fantastic form of political thought, and it's why I wanted to discuss it today. I don't usually start with quotes, uh, but I decided to start with two quotes. One by me. Uh, the, the, the top one is my thought. Uh, if Todd Gannon is listening on, over the internet, he will claim that this is a quote by Richard Rorty, in which I've taken the word philosophy out and the word usually out and put the word architecture in and just left the word usually out because it was badly written. And so now this is my idea. He, interesting architecture, derives from a contest between 
an intense vocabulary, which has become a nuisance, and a half-formed new vocabulary, which vaguely promises great things. I think it's a beautiful idea, and I'm really proud to have written that. Um, and, <clears throat> and I will leave it to you to, under, to decide whether that's a kind of plagiarism, or because I do think it's a little bit of what we're going to be seeing today. The second quote is from Moss. Uh, it is a really spectacular piece of philosophical thinking. Um, you'll know more about it in his talk. What I really like about these two is that they say a lot, almost the same thing. It has the kind of coming to the same point in the same way from very different points. These are two intuitional moments. These are forces, they, these are two individuals expressing in some sense the same forces in totally different circumstances and in totally different ways. Neither of them know what they're talking about. And yet they are saying something true. And so I'm going to leave that to you and now I'm gonna do what I like to do which is show pictures. Now, you are gonna say, oh, not this again. Uh, I made a promise to myself long ago that I would show these pictures as many times as I possibly can and as often as I possibly can until I die. <clears throat> and so I am going to show them again. If you haven't seen them uh, at least 50 times, then I'm not doing my job. For me, this is the single greatest moment of political philosophy in the 20th century in English. This is from The Life of Brian by Monty Python. And the scene goes like this. He's just given the Sermon on the Mount. He's a Jesus-like figure. These people are enthralled by his, his uh, char charisma and the beauty of his words, and they come up to him, and they say, please tell us more, please tell us more. And he says, listen to me, you've got it all wrong, which, by the way, is the title of this course. You don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow anyone. You're all individuals. And of course, they say, as a good sci art group of students, you would say the same thing. Yes, we're all individuals. And then they say, he says, you're all different. And they say, yes, we're all different. This is the part everybody remembers. It's hilarious. But this is the part I keep wanting you to pay attention to. This one guy says, I'm not. And this is the theory of the whole thing. This guy is saying, all by himself, alone in that crowd, I'm not different. I'm not an individual. I'm part of something. And of course, everyone hates him for that. And so this is the moment where that intuition is, has this political issue that I'd like to talk about. Now, um, lots of times art and architecture, one of the great uh, powers of art and architecture is for people to think it does just trivial stuff, decorations, does it really matter? You know, it takes great, all it can do in the world is look around the world and turn fantastic moments of art, of history, global history, into decoration. Uh, most of you don't know that photograph. Raise your hand if you know that photograph. Look at that. Raise a view if you think that photograph is from World War II. Ah, same number of people. If you think it's from the Vietnam War. Eric, you can excuse yourself. <laughs> if you know it ended the Vietnam War, or if you know it caused the end of the Vietnam War, it works pretty good as kitchen decoration. Okay. Uh, this is a, a film I also show a lot. This is uh, the typical role of architecture and literature, architecture as a, an instrument of power. So this is from Vias from uh, Vendetta. Bad people are in charge. Bad people have, uh, have to be stopped. So a group of people put on masks and oppose the bad people who are in uniforms, really ugly uniforms that are usually blue. And then the, blue, the, bad pe the people in masks gather together to oppose evil forces. And usually the way they do it is to blow up their building, the building of power. And they blow it up. This is Bataille's theory of architecture can only serve instantiated power. They blow it up, it's a pretty nice little sequence, and then they take their masks off. And now they're all back to being individuals. And of course, from an architectural point of view, this is the exciting moment because they have to say, now you wonder, okay, they've blown up that bad building and they got rid of those bad people. 
What we do next is what? What's the real question for, the, for you guys? For an architect, you're in architect school, what, is the, what are you thinking? Okay, what building do we now build for those new individuals, right? What's the new building, what's the new architecture? And of course, what happens is the movie ends. Okay, this is the building of the collective. And the, this is a concert hall. And then these are, these are a series, this is an architecture about, we're not uh, individuals, you know, you're, but also this is a building that goes through the Monty Python problem of, I don't wanna make a concert hall that turns everybody into a sub, subservient collective to an evil, or at least to an oppressive unanimity of one voice. Uh, this is Sharoon's concert hall built immediately after the end of World War II, the first building to be built in Berlin by the city planner. And he's building this concert hall in a city that has just used music as one of its great tools of propaganda in the Nazi experiment. So all of this is moving to the question of intuition today. And, the, and I asked all of you if you would look at uh, uh, Megan Dalder's Mirror Box film. Did, did you get a chance to watch it? Anybody, did y'all see the film? Let me see the video. Raise your hand if you did. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Uh, this is a art student just out of school, your age. If you look at her work, it's sometimes brilliant, sometimes totally dumb. If you listen to her presentations, it's like you at a final review, it's just, you know, it's you. She's your age, your way of thinking. Sometimes she bumbles in on on a great thing on the mirror box, he stumbled on something fantastic. Uh, in order to get that across, I want to show you some paint. I want to show you paintings as an instrument of politics that captures intuitions that no one can possibly know about hundreds of years in advance. This is a really bad painting. In my opinion, not a bad painting, this is a second rate painting of no real consequence, I think. Famous as it is. This is Las Meninas by Velazquez, one of the greatest painters in history. This is oftentimes hailed as one of the great paintings of art history. Um, it's well known to you because it's written so beautifully about by a, a philosopher named Foucault, um, who is very interested in the way it constructs points of view and how those points of view reflect various power relationships. And so this is the diagram of all the perspectival analysis of, so he painted this painting to show off his power as a painter to the king to get a job. It's a, it's a kid's toy. These are two paintings that I think are far better by him. Um, this is a, these are two of the, his paintings of the buffoons. Now Velazquez was a jerk. If you read his biography, these are not paintings to show you uh, the, to give you a sense of the intimacy or existential empathy he had for these buffoons that are treated like pets in the court of the king. These are paintings he painted for the king to show off his possessions. These people are possessions. This is one, this is a Kalevalas, and he, and it's a really, you know, he's a uh, mentally challenged uh, jester. And this is another one. Believe it or not, this is one of the court gestures as well. I love these two paintings. I think they're fantastic paintings. They, they are among the world's great paintings, I think. To, just for your, just so you know, this is actually, when I go out in public, how I think people see me. I really do think this is what they see. And this is, when I go out in public, this is how I see myself. But yeah, uh, I, it's true. And so this is, you know. if, uh, if you read the Foucault, this is the analysis of the existential points of view and the consequence of that. It's a very sophisticated piece of writing about a kind of goofy, not so great painting. If you're an architect, however, you, can, you have to be astonished at the apprehension of the space of the backgrounds of these paintings because it basically tells the entire history of architecture from the Baroque until modernism. That the space that in the end behind the um, Pablo de Valadois is the most incredible apprehension of modern space, uh, the corner. 
the, the, the role of a corner, the understanding of what it means to be in a corner, the use of the corner in the painting, it's one of the first times a corner like that is ever used. And so to go from the two-sided door and the, mirror of the, the use of the mirror to a corner and a domestic corner to a kind of modern space, I think it's an architectural understanding. That's an intuition of architecture in painting, unlike anything that you could possibly have understood. And so for an architect, at that time could never have understood it. And we would have had to have the whole history of architecture now to understand this instrumentalization of uh, this mobilization in these paintings of that work. Uh, I, I particularly like this painting because of the way it does so many things. Look at, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I mean, this is a, I realize now it's an hour lecture and I'll quit. You see this thing right here? This is called a pentamenti. So when a painter back then painted something, didn't like where it was, he would paint over it and then repaint it. So he didn't like where this piece was in the painting, he wanted to put it here. So he painted it over here, put it here. The painting he overpainted with, over time became transparent as oil painting does. And all of a sudden you get to see this. And so this is not something he wanted to be in there, but he, he was a, uh, Velasquez was a casual painter. He could care less about his pentamenti. He knew he would be dead in 25 years. He was, he was very casual about his paintings. Uh, and what relates these two paintings is this painting by, by, um, by Rauschenberg is in a corner. It relates to this corner. Like I said, one of the first uses of the corner in a painting. And the other one is it's filled with these doubles. So the Rubens is doubled in the mirror, but then this helicopter is doubled, and then this eagle is actually doubled in its reflection, and there's all of these doubles. So everything in the, these, the squares are doubled, so the entire painting is built on double after double after double, just like this pentamenti is doubled. And so it's clear that this idiotic accident that he could not possibly have known, that the two quotes we're speaking about, is totally informing this, the, the issues of contemporary painting, and in particular, this uh, issue of in the Rauschenberg. And in fact, the Pentamenti of Velasquez has a fantastic history. He was such a, he was such a great painter, uh, and so filled with himself, and so indifferent to the future of his paintings and the people that had owned him, that he actually cleaned his brushes on the canvas. No one unheard of, to, he would, paint and instead of just going across the room grabbing a rag to clean his brush he would wipe his brushes off on the canvas right there and right there because and then he would overpaint them because he knew that in 20 years when he was gone they'd come up so what so these are pentamenti strokes and bacon and in all of the velasquez studies of bacon bacon builds in references to the casual pentamenti as a key aspect of his influence by uh, Velasquez. So these trivial accidents become great sources of intuition. Now, this is Stephen Hall's uh, architecture uh, picks up on this. So this is Stephen Hall's uh, uh, Sloan, I mean, the addition to the museum in Kansas City, I forgot the name of it, the Nelson Atkins Museum. So you, you walk in the gallery, you come down the staircase, you see the de Kooning Woman 4 on the left there. So you, know, you see that, you see this painting, and then you, you, you see uh, the Robert Morris and the Donald Judd, and there's this ladder, and you're not sure is that ladder a work of art? I mean, all the doubling, you, everything is starting to, uh, you, you're not sure, uh, is that ladder a work of art, or is that case of lighting in the back of work of art. At this point, art is telling you that everything is art. You're a work of art. You don't, you're not sure yet where you stand as an individual, where you stand. How do you know yourself? You're trying to find out what you are. As you're in, Peter, uh, as you're in um, Steve's building, you look through a painting of a window on the other side, which puts, makes the window on the other side of the painting, and you know the people on the other side are looking back at you. So the building is building all of these reflections of, it's doing exactly what the Velasquez does initially with everyone in the building in a work just like that. In fact, there I am taking a picture. You see that little lit thing? I'm about to walk down that girl. I've taken a picture of that door. You've seen that door. There I am, you can see. Thin yet again, right there. 
And then, by the way, as I look at that ladder, right behind that ladder, there's Tracer. There's that painting I just got through showing you. Now with the... And then I'm thinking about, you know, so I'm thinking about when I walk through this door, then whoever is standing there is actually looking at me there in relationship to the de Kooning, just like one of those paintings. So the, this mechanism of constantly reflecting who we are back and forth is an instrument of, it's a contemporary digital instrument of constructing these, uh, the same issue that Megan constructed. And it goes on in architecture as well. This picture from small, medium, large, and extra large is a picture about a lot, this is the librarian that goes with Rem Cool Houses. This is the picture of the librarian, of the library, the small, medium, large library. This is OMA's uh, Bibliotheque Na Grand National Competition Entry. She, it doesn't say Cindy Sherman, doesn't say an untitled library still. It's just, obviously she's a library, librarian, and that's a library. Cindy Sherman's work, on the other hand, is about putting you in the pic as her. You identify with her, you become an untitled uh, film still, and so her work inscribes you as an, through identification, through these instruments of identification. Jillian Waring puts masks on, so much so that by the time you, that, these, that this capability of empathetic identification that we could not possibly have known, at, known about at the time of uh, Las Meninas, you don't really know that both of those are Jillian Waring's eyes. And it's easy for you to imagine that they're not. So when you look at this and you know these to be Jillian Waring's self-portraits with masks, could be her at different times, could be two different eyes, all of these as possible identifications are set into motion as intuitional possibilities by, by this entire construction of um, accidents and, and uh, mistakes. And so when Megan gets so far as it to do this uh, mirror box, we've been getting ready, we've been having the world get ready for her breakthrough intuition for 500 years. We've been taught by every piece of architecture, we've been taught by every painting, we've been taught by every window we've looked through to be ready for this. And so she goes to UCLA, studies a little bit of media art, draws a drawing in five seconds about how to put two mirrors in a box and does a mirror box and you watch the thing of it. And the same thing is happening with these concert halls. So the Vienna Concert Hall, Hitler's favorite place to listen to music, the source of all great acoustics in every concert hall, then has to get worked through by Sharoon because you can't, he has to figure out how to not let people sit together. So this horrible place, this horrible auditorium where nobody can sit together in one unity, this, this mistake of planning is the only way you can put an audience together in that place at that time. And it becomes the, one of the great expressions of how architects respond with mistakes and errors and intuitions to a, a political problem in, in building. And I won't go through this, but you know, this picture of the concert hall, uh, a total, you know, is about, like this is the pic, this is not the picture of the concert hall, which we'd like to see it as a sculpture. This is the picture of the, Anyway, this is, the, this is the interior of this room. This is the picture of the concert hall, which is trying to relate all the tall buildings to the background to this silly little building across the street where the curvature across the street gets integrated with the background. And then it has this fantastic interior, I won't go over it. Then this silly upside down building in, in Portugal, in uh, Porto, which is clearly doesn't want to be there. You know it doesn't want to be there because it's upside down and it won't even touch the place. It, it looks like, it's a, it builds its own little ground, it detaches its ground from the ground. So this is a building that says, we are individuals where, you know, I'm not, but the way I wanna be in Lisbon, the way I'm sorry, the way I wanna be in Porto is to not be in Porto. Like, I'm in Porto, I wanna listen to music with my fellow porto -esians, and what we wanna do is not be from Porto, sorta. Look, look at the effort he goes to make sure it doesn't belong to Porto as a mistake, as an intuition. Finally, one of the great uh, rejections of a place in all of architectural history, and that's uh, Nouvelle, who I don't think has an idea in his head. 
This is a guy who works entirely on intuition. For every great project he does, I can show you 50, I don't get it projects. But this is a fantastic project in Copenhagen, and it's based on a famous quote from Shakespeare, which says, there's something rotten in Denmark. Uh, and so he builds his concert hall, God knows why, and decides to put it in a temporary construction container. This is the concert hall, which by the way, there it is, is nothing but the Sharoon stuck inside this shipping container. You go and you enter it, you go in, and you know, it's just, I need to get the hell out of Denmark. So these, so not only, Porto kind of belongs, this thing is about, if I'm gonna go to listen to music in, in Denmark with my fen, fe, fellow Danes, it's gonna all be about, I don't wanna be in Denmark. And so I think these are fantastic moments in art and architecture that show us roles of intuition that connect, that make everything contemporary, that speak from Velasquez to Megan Dalder from a 10 year old, that, that we can line up histories of architecture like we can line up paintings, and that mean a thought like Eric's, that the adequacy of the self and the adequacy of intuition is probably the most underrated and serious uh, issue that we have yet to explore, and now I'm gonna turn the dais over to Eric. I think what you started out to do unravels the whole operational principle of the thing, because it seems to me you're, you're, you're contradicting yourself if you say this is a proposition or a theory or a postulate that applies to everybody, like with this Sermon on the Mount business, and everyone shows up and says, yes, this is me. But as a, so this is a point of view, but it's no different than Darwin's point of view, Marx's point of view. In other words, this is the way it works. But I'm not saying anything like that. I'm not saying this is the way it works. Um, I think all I'm saying is I'm trying to figure out a way to have it work that's intelligible to me. Not that it would necessarily apply elsewhere to anyone else, or if it did, case by case, but it's not a proposition which is an alternative to some theoretical postulate. Um, the, the reason I have a few of these um, well-known characters to, to share with you. So this is Charles Darwin. Um, and I have one of Darwin, one of Newton, one of Marx, and one of Freud, only because these are characters that for a lot of us who have looked at the history and the discourse over the last uh, two, three hundred years, they're seminal characters who apparently have had a lot to say and a lot of influence in how we understand who we are. Um, and, and I think there's, what I wanna say, and I said this when, when uh, Todd and Billy were talking, this, is, this really comes out of that the other night when I, when I introduced them, and I think I started by saying something about Darwin, although not a hell of a lot. Uh, this is Charles Darwin, the man of natural selection, sailing on the beagle, uh, origin of the species, and he forgot about the cliffs of Chile, left it out. And, and I think what these characters represent is they, they represent, I think what we can call, and this might be the opposite of instinct or, or intuition, determinists in the sense that what they're looking for is a way that we can explain our world back to ourselves. And why are they there? And why are we listening? And if they're not there, what's the alternative? And I think if, if you stand on a beach and you look at the, at the sky or you look at the sea or you look at the beach and what is it? It might be if Wolf shows up, 
a discussion of cities, too. What's a city in a fundamental way? Why is it? Why do we need it? And I think, I think you might be able to make an argument that there isn't anything intrinsically so about any of these, except it's pretty vast. And we can't deal with vast. So we have to measure it, or subdivide it, or bisect it, or rule it, or quantify it, or qualify it in order to have something to talk about and we can say this is the way it is. I think one of the points in, in Lukic's uh, 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 discussion is that there isn't anything which is extr extrinsically so, that what we're claiming is so is never, it can't be disassociated from the people who are making the claim. I think my point is we need this stuff. We can't operate without it. We need the rule, so we need Darwin, and we need Newton, and we need Marx, and we need Freud, who I think if, if they deserve any credit, deserve credit as inventors, inventors, not discoverers, and a discoverer would be someone who finds something which is durable and intrinsically so. And an inventor is someone who makes something up which is sufficiently plausible that after a while a number, there are a number of, of believers and adherents and it lasts for a while until it starts to come apart again and then somebody else invents something else, which is why I said Darwin missed the cliffs of Chile. When Darwin sailed his boat next to the cliffs of, of Chile, so Darwin is a guy talking about natural selection, right? And increment by increment by increment over a long period of time. He sails by the cliffs of Chile and he looks up at this sort of mile high slice, uh, chasm, break, and that doesn't look geologically like something that happened increment by increment, and it isn't. It's something that belongs to a different causal, nobody is clear exactly what that is, but a different cause or a different chronology or a different sequence. So it probably turns out that natural selection and bit by bit really doesn't explain everything. It may not explain anything. It may explain a few things. So, so inevitably, whatever is the hypothesis and whatever is the theory, it leaves, it leaves something essential out. Now, there's another character that, that, that we talked about a little bit in the first session, uh, this Princeton guy called Emmanuel Velikovsky who had a different idea and his idea had to do with, for instance, a rock hits the Yucatan and all the dinosaurs die just like that. So it turns out, if that's so, that it has nothing to do with the survival of the fittest the way you learned. Uh, it may have to do with the survival of the luckiest, which depending whether you were in the Yucatan or the other side of the world, it's a different way of looking at how things move and it's also a very different way of disassociating the incredible adolescent allegiance to science as if it's an abstract series of principle, as opposed to understanding that it's not science, it's the science that belongs to the scientists. And the history of science, I think, is the history of positions that scientists have invented, not something which is intrinsically so, which is believable for all time. It's never like that, whatever is the religion and certainly the architecture of the last hundred years, particularly the modern stuff. I, mean, I think it's fair to say there, was, there is a modern architecture, uh, if you're interested. It probably lasted from about 1920 to 1930, and that was the end of it. But the advocacy of science allegedly science-based technology, physics, machine equipment, and the image of that belongs to this kind of faith. It's no different than any other faith. 
in, in, in science as a discoverer of something which is intrinsically so. In other words, a rule-based system that we can rely on because we need it, because none of you guys can operate without that as a way of guiding what you do. So anyway, Darwin tried to help you, but he left out the cliffs of Chile. And, and Newton is another guy with gravity and, and, and uh, uh, cause, uh, cause and effect, all of that. Uh, and, yeah, hang on a second. There was, there was a quote, uh, an interesting quote that I had from Kierkegaard, um, not so much in equity between cause and effect, but big cause, little effect, or little cause, big effect, so that there's not necessarily a balance in the position between, between uh, an impetus and, and a result. But it's a causal, causal way of, of, of looking and, and, and thinking and, and working. And it, it, it suggests, again, a, a, a stable, uh, harmonic, balanced model. And then uh, this guy, who's, who's been part of, of lots of discussions, uh, uh, social and political and artistic discussions over the years. Uh, this is this is Marx. Um, the specter is is haunting Europe, as as again a prognosticator. It's it's not so much. This is like a law, I guess. The thesis, antithesis, synthesis that he borrowed. This is a law. It's a historical law. This is the way history works. He tells us. So something arises, and then the antithesis arises, and then there's a reconciliation of the two, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, belongs to a sort of Hegelian uh, idea. And then it repeats itself. This was, this was the idea, except when communism comes, according to the theory, it doesn't repeat itself. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and then it ends in a hypothetical state. And then, of course, all of the revolutions that took place in the 20th century in Russia, in China, in Vietnam, in Cuba, and other places took place where there was virtually no industrial proletariat. So you could make an argument that his critical analysis of a capitalist system, which belonged to the 19th century anyway, was worth reading and thinking about and understanding. But the prognosis was wrong across the board wrong, consistently wrong, but, but the idea that we should, we should follow it and we should use it, again, belongs to all of us because we need it. We need it in order to help us say who we are as we talk to ourselves about who we are and what we do. And if you don't do that, what do you do? What's the option? And this is Freud and the Oedipus complex and the Electra complex, and, and so you've heard all of that discussed and what belongs to males. And I think the joke with uh, Todd and Billy was that he left out Prozac. There's, all, of course, always something, not that Prozac solves much of anything either. <coughs> but all of these characters rep represent a way of, of applying a methodological hypothesis to the world we're in, giving it priorities, giving it a way of understanding, giving it a system, giving it something you can count on, giving it a way of depending on a structure which exists outside of you. And I think what I'm saying is maybe there is no structure that exists outside of you, in which case you have to, neg you, you have to find a way to navigate in that context if you accept it, even if it makes you uncomfortable as hell, because if it's so for you, then it's so, and you have to figure out how to do it. This is the, the a piece that, that um, my dad wrote in uh, Kipnis borrowed, the adventures of people are at random and the readings are illegible. At best, we improvise instruments, instruments according to which they can be treasured or despised. We camp on the marches of the unknown, 
push ambivalently into the uncharted and so on and so on. Um, Jeff asked me about that, if you go down, this is a very long poem, Thomas Promise, and what that is. Uh, Thomas was Jesus's brother, who is sometimes known as Doubting Thomas. So a promise from Doubting Thomas means there's not necessarily a promise. And I think the reason for putting this up is that this is the alternative. This is the alternative, which is not really an alternative, so everybody come and sign up on this line as opposed to the previous four lines. But this, this suggests a way of working which doesn't guarantee much of anything, or a way of thinking about what you might do and why without any warranty that a certain result will be forthcoming. I mean, the Oedipus complex predicts a result, and cause and effect predicts, uh, predicts a result. Um, and, and the Communist Manifesto predicts a result. And this predicts no result and doesn't warranty anything except to make the effort because that's what's available to you. Um, this, is, this is another way of, of looking at, at instinct uh, or intuition. And there's a term that I, I've used a few times um, to try to talk about this um, called the dialectical lyric. And a dialectical lyric is not to, to say something that sounds either complicated or that belongs to Hegel or to Marx. But if, if this is not so, and that's not so, so if Marx is not so forever, or Freud is not so forever, or Newton is not so forever, but the possibilities that you could arrive at certain conclusions have more to do with contradictions and dealing with contradictions simultaneously. For instance, if you could deal with natural selection and gradualism and catastrophism simultaneously, which in a literal sense, in a, in a conventional scientific sense, seem to contradict each other, but conceivably could operate together, could coalesce, because everything doesn't have to fit into the pro forma. Everything has to fit into Marx, everything has to fit into Freud, everything has to fit into Newton, everything has to fit into Darwin. In, the, in a dialectical lyric, it doesn't work that way. This is another rendition of that, which, which I always like. And I think it suggests the limits of reason that, that there, there are intuitions or instincts or sensibilities that reach, outreach reason. If you can get there and you can't always call up the case by virtue of the logic that you want to apply to it. And this is, this is a line I used uh, several times. And this is not to disparage again someone who is clinically a schizophrenic. I don't, I don't mean it that way. But I think, I think the, to, to return to the question, which was the original question that has to do with both an intuition or an instinct, which is obligatory in making a radical piece of architecture, and then an implementation capacity, which needs a different set of tools in other words, one is to imagine it, whatever that means, and two is to imagine a way to implement what you imagined. And the first, whatever it belongs to, intuition, instinct. The second actually brings you into a world in a more extroverted way, in a tactical way, in a mechanical way, in a technical way, in order to realize what you originally imagined. They're very different skills, actually. They're very different, they're very different skills, very different personality. And I think I, think I would argue to, to make radical architecture, you have to be capable of doing both of those things, both, both to, to imagine it 
in a private way, wherever it comes from, and then to implement it in the world, on the street, in a technical, tactical, in some cases, political way. So this, this goes back a, a, a long way to, to this project, which originally belonged to the uh, uh, Salonen and, and, and uh, Fleischmann in the, in the Green Umbrella uh, project. And the Green Umbrella series was, was a series at the LA Phil that produced only experimental music. So we began to do the project with, with the LA Phil and these are, the, these are the original sketches. And then comes something which, which I think uh, people who build things will understand is a fascinating par paradox, that the freer are the instincts for imagining or making in a contradictory way, in a paradoxical way, the more rigorous and the more demanding are the tools that are required, a kind of excruciating tool. If you imagine something is very free, and then you have to build literally something which manifests that freedom, and the technical tools to do it, and to think about it, I think in an intellectual way, are contradictory to the kinds of instincts that imagined it to begin with. This is, this is a long story. I've, I've shared it here in different ways on, on uh, a number of occasions when we, when we started out to bend the glass and ultimately found somebody in, in San Pedro uh, who could bend it and, and, and we were told you can't do it and you can't laminate it and it'll crack and it'll fall and it'll leak and you'll be sued and all of that. And, and as I've said, and it's true, all of those things happened. It did crack, it did break, it did leak, we couldn't draw it, and we did get sued. Um, all, all, of those, all of those things, which are sort of ancillary propositions, it's one thing to stand up here and say that, it's another thing to sort of deal with depositions and subpoenas. How that fits into this discussion is probably a different story. But you can see in, in, in the image on the left where we, we were trying to do a number of things. We ultimately came up with something which is more like a kiln and actually sandwiched the glass. And, and, uh, but we went through a whole series of experiments and, and, and uh, uh, construction episodes and, and things breaking and, and, and falling down. Um, and this is really not so much to, to tell a story which is either dramatic or melodramatic. It's always different telling a story in retrospect when the result is known and it actually came, in, it came out all right and they built the building and everybody uh, went off uh, holding hands and kissing goodnight. But at the time that you're working on it, you don't actually know. And you don't know where it's gonna go and you don't know whether it'll fail or whether, or, or whether it'll succeed. And I think that tension, that tension in terms, of the, in terms of the prospect that it might work and it might fail, and I think that's where you have to go. That's where you have to go in order to do this, and then you have to deal with the consequences and then working various ways to, to implement what was the original conceptual uh, vision of the thing and, and, and so on. And then there, there are a few of these I won't go through all, uh, in, in, in all of the detail, but there's, a, there's an interesting question for me of, of complexity. There's a lot of discussion around here and other places about what actually constitutes complexity. What does it mean? And you, know, you see students that the, more, that the more exotic, the more unrecognizable, the more, the more complex in, in form and shape and, and space, the more is achieved. So I'm not sure any of that is so, but this is an example. I think this is an example of a complex piece made out of complex pieces. And this is an example of a complex piece made out of very simple pieces. So that, so that the, the aspiration might be the same, but the tools to make them are, are very different. Obviously, the, the, the drawing capacity is, is essential to this. 
and the ability to, to imagine or to reconcile, again, these are all pretty simple pieces, the sheet metal and metal deck and lights and sprinklers and all of that, how to put those together as part of the discussion and, and so on. I think this is, uh, this is the third one. I, uh, this is a very old sketch from the high rise which we're, which we're trying to build now at La Cienega and Jefferson. But the note in the, in the uh, lower right-hand corner was of some interest to me, which says, uh, everything keeps going. There's always another stop that you didn't take. And again, this is, I think this is back to the adventures of, of people are at random, and you intervene in that in the way that you're capable of intervening. But you didn't solve it. You didn't get it, you didn't resolve it, you didn't accept in, in, in a tentative way or an abbreviated way, set up a sufficient perform, performer for yourself to make decisions and to do a project. But the durability of that performa, I think, is, is in question, and I'm saying it, it has relatively little durability, and that's why you come back and back and back to the, the tools are wonderful. I mean, the tools have allowed us to do things that, that we couldn't do before. I think I talked about, about this project uh, a little bit in the, in the first symposium, because I think what, what we have to do here um, is, uh, this is a building with no columns and no beams, and it has, and there is no way to have it approved by the Department of Building and Safety in the city, except essentially to invent your own building code. Um, and, you, and you call in experts and you pay for those experts and then you invent something which is not only plausible as an alternative idea, it has to ratify the previous idea. So this is a, a retrogressive uh, uh, approval process in principle, you know what I mean? In other words, it's not, Here's the old, here's the new, I'll get rid of the old, I'll introduce the new, I'll prove it to you that it works and we'll do that. But it doesn't work that way. It's here's the old, here's the new, here's what we want to do, and I'll show you how the old is in fact manifest in the new. So it's retrogressive, it makes it very difficult for us, but I think at some point we, uh, we're getting close now, after 15 years. Um, uh, this is this is the last image. We're making we're making a a, a new book, um, and uh, it's it's of interest to me in a political way. So this is the schizophrenia is a cure, not a disease, in the implementation sense, because it's the first time that 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 the New York guys and Rizzoli have worked with the AADCU guys in China. Um, so I think this is a precedent which is, which is important for us. I think the main issue is the title. It's not I'll believe it when I see it, which means I'll believe it when I see it. Prove it to me, I'm a scientist and I'll accept it. It's the alternative. I'll see it when I believe it. I'll tell you it's so and that'll make it so. Thank you very much. I, uh, I do think impl implementation is sort of what I wanted to make the conversation about. Um, the, uh, I, I know no one in this audience, there's going to be a few people in this audience that are just going to cringe when I'm about to say this, but I was actually trying to work on this uh, text for the thesis book. <laughs> and I've been, I, I try to, you know, first I wanted to write a text about what a thesis was. You know, in the end, I'm trying to figure out what happens at SciArc and what happened during the thesis and all that sort of stuff. And at one point I was trying to think, what is SciArc, why is it such an incredible place? Why do I love it so much? And one thing for sure is it's not a place where we teach what you should do as architects. It may happen, 
that there are little enclaves of people that do that. You know, uh, certainly Anna. Um, but <laughs> it's not a place where the school has that uh, self sense of itself as a responsibility. I started to wonder if it's a place where maybe in the long run it's just a place we teach what you can do. Um, but then that's not enough because I realize you can't really formulate the project of what you can do unless you know sort of what you want to do. I mean, it's kind of what you're talking about, right? You can't explore what you can do in architecture unless you have a narrative of some sort of what you want to do. So you can't just sit around and invent techniques or teach techniques or teach every structural possibility or every material possibility as if you could walk out of this school or walk out of any school with a full repertoire of current control over all the adventures that are materially possible in your discipline and get ready for your intuitions. You could, you could teach that. You could do that. Like a military academy, you know, shoot this gun, fly this plane, sail this submarine. Yeah, but let me you answer. You could do that. Because I think, for example, one of, the, one of the fingerprints or one of the hallmarks of modernity is to recognize the potential of incompetence. You know, to realize that bad, a moment of bad construction or a moment of bad painting or a, le or a bad, a missed chord or a wrong note or a bad detail in the right hands could, became a real potential. And so incompetence in the right hands uh, was able to imbue uh, expertise with an entirely new repertoire. And so that's what I'm saying is military, they kind of have to hit the target. Whereas in art and architecture, every time you do something and you produce a new set of competence, there's a whole new repertoire of incompetence. So I'm not so sure, you know, like, I, I, I was telling someone this morning that they, they're having a do, DIY stuff, you know, you're teaching a DIY studio, and I'm saying, listen, first thing you do is tell them not to clean the site. Like, if you really want it to give the, the right aesthetic, make sure they leave all the crap on the ground. You know, that, that would be the right view of stuff. So I'm not sure uh, that you're right. I'm sure you could teach control ever form. The reason I'm doing this, I want to answer. I'm not saying we should do that. Well, I, I'm saying one could do that. If one could do that, maybe I think we, one might Consider that. In fact, I mean, I think many schools do that. Not only really? architecture schools, I law schools. I mean, you need, know, you need to know this, you need to know this, you need to know well, this. What you, you need, need to know. know and what you can't, like, I'm asking you, for example, and, I, and I've been looking at Wolf's work. Like, if you line up Wolf's work, it's all about not just what leap he could take, but what leap he thinks he could make. You know, like, right now with the bondage building or whatever you're now calling it, you're, you're taking a, you've taken a few leaps that you have had a general sense you could make. I don't know any cases where you failed to make the leap. This is a case, this is a clay case you, are there? Are there any cases? I mean, that's a, quite a list. <laughs> um, but how do you know? Like, when you have well, but that's the, that's the point. I, I think what I was saying is when you're sitting there and a the glass is raining down on your head, and at that point, you don't, I mean, there's confidence, there's conviction, there's uh, whatever it is, we can figure it out. Um, so I think it presupposes competence, conviction, stick to itiveness, but I don't think there's any warranty on any of those things. Otherwise, we would have built the Mexico City Library and the Mariinsky and the Queens Museum and all the things you listed. So you don't think can, you could have built the Marinsk, Marinsky? Um, I do think we could have built that thing, but the Russians didn't. Yeah. And I you don't think you made the case you could, or? Well, that's a different issue, and that has to do with one, the instinctive side, and then the can you implement it side, which is not a small issue. It's certainly not a small issue for me in some cases. Can you do it? I mean, the Smithsonian's another example right. like that. 
I think we, I mean, we walked in a room with half of Europe from London and New York and <laughs> rattled up, said you can't do it. Well, can't do it. Can't pay for it and it'll fall down. Can't pay for it is a different kind of thing. Well, if the, do if the uh, donor is sitting in the room, okay. <laughs> but then there was the, uh, I mean, I'm just, uh, this is, I won't waste a lot of time. This, there was this wonderful moment where you thought the spring and, uh, and where was that? Oh, the Mariinsky thing? No, 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 the spring in... Uh, oh, Kazakhstan. That you thought was going to actually help with yeah. earthquakes, and it yeah. turned out to make it worse. <laughs> no, we brought Guy into that. Yeah, that so you had the spring that was going to the earthquakes. Well, I think your point was where the hell did that come from? Yeah. We were talking about a project we had, we had proposed in a, a competition. Suha is coming here. Suha ran it in... in yeah. The Turkish guy ran it in Kazakhstan. It's a big he's company. coming here. And it, yeah, he's coming to visit. Um, which was never, which was never built, and we proposed a solution which is a kind of attenuated spring, and the argument was that it allowed the project. This is a huge earthquake zone, just a little bit, a little bit west of Xinjiang Province in in China. So all that whole area is, is is a seismic zone. So it is this uh, uh, spring. <laughs> And uh, so Guy was, was, was the engineer, and he, he came, came in a room and he said, Moss, what the hell are you doing? You do that, and it'll wind up in China. <laughs> so, uh, but, so, but we used it in the end, actually, in, in a more attenuated way and damped it down. And it, it gave a, a, a form language to the project, which nominally was related to, to dealing with seismic issues, but whether that's really the origin or just, you know, maybe a little bit disingenuously. Yeah, but a lot of stuff shows up in your work that uh, feels intuitive in a, in a... Well, you have to, you in, have to, in a you have to find a way, way, in a political sense, you, you also have to find a way to some extent, particularly in these competitions, to camouflage some of the aspiration. So if there's an interest in whatever the poetics are of spring structures, um, that probably wouldn't satisfy, I can't remember who was on the jury, but Suha. Was I was supposed other, to be. Who's that other, yeah, you, if you'd have shown up, Sorkin, who's that, the, the other guy that teaches Neon Gavante? Lise is, uh, uh, anyway, he was, he was there. Hani Rashid. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, yeah, I was supposed to. Go, yeah, yeah, where the hell were you? On the tarmac in Chicago <laughs> for four days. <laughs> but you pocketed the dinero anyway. No, I didn't uh, get. It. I was. I it was cost me thirty-two thousand dollars to yeah, miss that thing. Right. Well, maybe we'll do it again. But but I but I do think <laughs> yeah, the please. the um, when when I was I'm not sure I explained this very well. I'm not sure I understand it very well. But the schizophrenia meant. That, that there are two very different aspects to making unusual architecture. And if you're drawing them, I don't know who this is, Lebius or Eric Mendelssohn or somebody drawing things and then going to the Potsdam and trying to build them, and you don't know how to build it, you can't do it. So how to build it means a political side and it means a technical side and it means an extroverted side, whereas the imaginative side is more introverted. So there are two sides of a personality, I think, and you don't find too many people who have both sides, really. Uh, Almost none. I mean, what you said about Wolf is interesting. I mean, is it worth talking about? In other words, are you rolling the dice on things you think you might not be... A, you know, how long should the cantilever be? Nine miles, eight miles, seven miles? <laughs> yeah. You know, at what point can you get away with it? Or do you throw it out there and reel it back in? Or do you throw it out there and you say, we're either doing that or I quit? Um, you, then, then another issue, and that is, uh, and I appreciate what you're saying about me, uh, and if I theorize a general structure of indiv individual intuition, um, it defeats the point in a certain sense. And that's th why I think that's what I was saying. I think you tried to no, I'm, turn I'm, I'm, the exception into a rule. Well, I, what I'm trying to say is that 
that what is structured is exceptionality. Uh, but, but it being structured doesn't turn it into commonality. And well, not everybody will do it. Well, I mean, I, for example, I think to be... Not everybody has a stomach for it. Well, it, I know, but I, I think it's, you know, uh, to... You, you, de, you depend on a lot of people liking to make, enjoying, and genuinely enjoying to make everyday normal buildings. In other words, you depend, on, in a certain sense, on a ground against which your work is a figure. Well, that's, that's a standard argument, that it is what it is in juxtaposition to everything that it isn't. No, I, no, I, mean, I, I think your work is maybe. what it is in its own right, but it certainly depends on a context in which it is distinct. I don't, I mean, that may be so, looking at it from a distance and saying, you do this and somebody does this and somebody does that. I think we're just interested in trying to figure out how we can do what we want to do. Yeah. But and I, not I said, necessarily, and your job think, is to evaluate it. But what I'm saying is, I think all those other people are too. You know, I don't think they have decided not to give expression to their instincts. I think their instincts tend to be towards more conventional causes and more conventional, like... I don't know, the way you're talking about it, it's kind of like you walk in and talk to a psychiatrist and you're telling the psychiatrist how I want to be creative or something. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with it. You <laughs> work on the thing with ideas and people and points of view, and it's not so much that there's, that there's a kind of overriding, overarching motive to do this as opposed to that. You just get into the workings of the process and it keeps you alive, maybe. Yeah. Uh, or the opposite, or both. Well, I mean, for example, you know, I'm a beneficiary, all the four people you put up there, I'm a beneficiary, personally, of their accuracy. <laughs> you got a big problem. <laughs> really? Oh, how about all their inaccuracy? What? Because you don't get to do it that I way. If you say, say this is the way the world works, <laughs> except for this and this and this and so this. You're about to, like, let's say in one sentence you're right. And what am I supposed to do? All of a sudden, I'm no longer, my career is gone, my success in psychoanalysis if is gone. If it is, my, then you'd you know, have to start over. You cannot declare. I did. <laughs> yeah. You know, for example, start George, over. George Orwell is, like, what happens when I say, uh-uh? When he says, there is no argument that can, what was the quote? There is no argument Defend that can. Defend a poem? Yeah, and I just say, uh-huh. All of a sudden, there is one. Mm, you have to make you your know, case. All of those, play, all of those You can't just say, uh-huh. He you did. You can say whatever what you, you want. He did. He says, there is no argument that can defend a poem. And I said, well, as I, an I just instinct, say, George, you're full of shit. Yeah, but that doesn't get us anywhere. Neither does his. No, it does. His declaration. It helped me. That only may not help you. Only because you thought it was true. No. That's no, not an argument, so much my friend. That's just a declaration. No, no, no. It's not so much that it's intrinsically true for everybody for all time. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in my own experience, and I've probably everybody here, I know damn well the limits of trying to, to logically and systematically and methodologically spell out a case for something which, having done it, always falls short I would of what argue. you think it means. So meaning, yeah. wait a minute, so, so meaning in a poetic sense, and this is what he's saying, it's not trivial, that meaning in a poetic sense, which might mean contradictions or illusions or metaphors or pieces that are missing might be just as, as satisfactory, or in my case, even more so, than, than a treatise or a manifesto which falls short. So I think there is a case. The reason I think so is not because I like it, but because it ratifies something in my experience that I've learned. Obviously, it didn't stop me from trying to make an argument. I okay. probably. Uh I would say arguments gave birth to the idea of poems, that in my lifetime, 
I've had nothing but teachers bring poems that were inert to me to life. Uh, what do you mean by? I mean, I would. I read J. Alfred Prufrock. Thought it was the sad, really sad. I had no. I didn't. You know, and then someone had a teacher teach it to me. I didn't realize how funny it was and how hilarious it was. And yeah. How, yeah. And I think I do that for paintings. I think today. I don't know if you like the paintings I showed. I thought. I made arguments that uh, did that exactly what Orwell said you cannot do for a poem for a series of paintings today in a very short period of time. I don't think, I think you, you, you're reading it like a rule because you need a rule. I there mean, is nobody, no, nobody I, has when said. I see, when, you, when that thing says there is no argument that can defend a poem. Yeah. Sounds like a rule to me. No, because, because, it, because <laughs> you hear what you've, Gotten Monte used? Here. No, you hear what you've gotten used to listening for. Well, then tell me what it should say. And you don't you to know how like. to listen. No, well, let me finish. Okay. You don't know how to listen for what you haven't heard yet. So that means when you have a conversation, you actually already know what's coming back, well, which is not a like conversation. Means, I hate when people don't like the poems I like. Why? Who cares? No, I'm saying I, it sounds more like that's what he was saying. Do you like owl-eyed Athena? No. Yeah, because no, I don't know. I it. love that. <laughs> Iliad. Uh, he, I don't like the verse part of it, but I like the guys when the people get killed part. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> Odysseus, man of tactics. I like Odysseus. Smartest guy in the world. Yeah, man I like of Odysseus. tactics. I like particularly. Yeah, you'd uh, like Odysseus. No person put my eye out. I like the genderless version of that. No man. I just got through saying I like. <clears> but it is no gender man. corrected. Version. You know what he's talking about? Yeah. Nope. Polyphemus, you know, the Cyclops. So Odysseus is locked in a cave and uh, with his guys. With one and, eye, and, guy with and, one eye. And Polyphemus says, what's your name? So Odysseus is already, because he's the smartest guy in the world, the man of Texas. So he's trying to, to figure out how he can put this guy, he has a whole plan. So he says, my name is whatever it is. My name is no name or no man, no, no man. whatever. So he says that, so the polyphemus says, that's kind of a strange name. And then they figure out and they put his eye out and they sneak out of the cave and then polyphemus comes out of the cave and he's yelling to all the other cyclopses, you have to come and help me, somebody did so and so. And they said, oh, who did it? And he said, no one, <laughs> no man, which was Odysseus. Therefore, nobody did it, so they Odysseus can't said, help no. him, so Odysseus sailed away. Yeah, he, said, he said, no one put my eye out. I like that. And they, they said, oh, well, what can you know, we do? You like that story? Yeah, I love yeah. that story. I used it before. It doesn't really work for the police. <laughs> 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 no, I, but, you know, look, I, I don't, I believe... Uh, you know, it's, it, if I said to you, there is no objective truth. Oh, come on. You know, it's, th <laughs> it's that kind of argument. But it doesn't need to be one I know, of it those, doesn't need to be. You know, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like a sort of West Jones discussion. Well, he's gone. Well, he'll be back. Uh, what I'm saying even is, even if he's not back, why? the discussion will be back. It's not that kind of discussion. Listen, I'll, nothing okay. personal. Hang on. Uh. What I'm saying is, I don't care if these guys' work all the guys you talked about, hold up in the adamant totality that they needed to state it in, in order for it to I agree with you 100%. take purchase. I agree with you. But I do think. But their case, it's been their, argument, their argument is, is incredibly debilitated. I mean, you can't read Marx and say, what the hell happened in Cuba or Russia or China or Vietnam, all countries with no industrial proletariat where all of these alleged communist revolutions... Yeah, do you blame Marx for that? He left out a little, that's for sure. Marx would just say, you know, that, those weren't Marxist revolution, revolutions. Marxist revolutions required Well, then all of the guys, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Zhou Enlai, Ho Chi Minh, Fidel, are all full of shit. They just misread Marx. Oh, yeah, so everything they're talking about has no intrinsic association with the theory of history that they claim to be a part of for a hundred years. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty big miss. I, I read Marx. I use Marx. I like but a lot of But did you hear like what Marx. I said? Uh, yes, I yeah, did. It's a pretty far off. I one. don't feel like, 
I'm a Marxist. I don't think Fidel, you know, what I'm saying is they mobilize thought. Some, some people get very passionate about mobilizing that thought. Um, some people feel that they're mobilizing that thought and act in its name. I think a lot of the people, like Fidel. I think Fidel thought, I, I know early Mao thought he was a strict Marxist and then later on realized he wasn't and became a Maoist. In, in architectural, the point is in architectural Mao's, history. Mao is a Chinese emperor and so is Stalin I, a Russian emperor. Which is why yeah. they, by the way, they all produce their own doctrines. Stalinism, Leninism, Maoism, Little Red Book. What is the doctrine of Stalin? Gulags? Uh, <laughs> Kill the Kulaks? There's no doctrine. The, I mean, that's not a doctrine. One, it's one, not a doctrine as Marx is a doctrine. But I understand that. But I'm, what I, and I, all I'm saying is you don't need to vilify a body of work that has had an incredible instrumentality and positive effect in the world. For example. No, look, Jeff. Let's I, talk I, about, I, for example. You're around. right. I agree, I, I agree with you. If you're a wanderer, and you wander through the world, and you wander through the world of ideas, and you open things up, and you take a look, dog-eared field manual. That's what that means. I love that. It didn't say no field manual. It said dog-eared, meaning overused, worn out, limited, but not gone. But now, let me ask you about your work. Here's what I know. So that's what Marx is. Here's what I know Dog to be true manual. about the future of your work. Here's what I know to be true. Here are its likely vicissitudes. Okay. Sure. Uh, whether it continues to survive as a building or not, it doesn't matter any longer. I mean, because it it's, matters to me. I know. So, matters to me. <laughs> um, I'm sure it mattered to the architects of the six out of seven wonders of the world that are no longer around, that it, it mattered to them too, but I'm pretty sure they'd be okay with it now that they made the six out of seven. <laughs> <laughs> the list, who made that list? And <laughs> you? I don't know, but it seemed kind of lazy. Oh, we got the seven, let's call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> That's the seven wonders of the ancient, ancient world. Ancient world, yeah. And now we got seven of them. There the aren't any wonders in the contemporary world. Um, one is more than likely, and this is just for statistical reasons, it will be totally forgotten. Just like lots of work. Second one is it will be forgotten of necessity if it's ever going to be remembered. Okay? That is just, it, it, all work that comes back and finds its eventual importance goes through an incredible period of quiescence and it just, it does. Now, the last part is, and I'm really interested in this, when it finds its rebirth and its, whatever its importance will be, will have nothing to do with what you thought it was about. But historians at that time will trace it to an intuition you had in the context of its, let's say, a virtuality of the intuition you had in the context of its environs that you could not have known about. If when you go back and you read what we say about Palladio, what we say about uh, yep. Corb, now that is, by the way, I believe, one of the great miracles. It's a, it's a kind of a gimmick. I'm not, I love it. Uh, it's because we keep rewriting our own constructions of our contemporary self into the history. There's not, you know, I'm not saying that, but it, it says something about your, the conflict you need between your intentional relationship to your work and your reliance. I don't think so. I, I, I don't feel that. I hear what you're saying, and I know the juxtaposition between what's done and what or what they do and what you do or something like that. I think the conflict is inside of me. I don't think it's a conflict with the outside. I mean, it may manifest itself that way. And, and as far as the, this, this uh, business with how history treats whatever it, whatever it treats, you know, Luck actually made that comment that an 18th century character looking at the Himalayas sees a different mountain range than the 21st. Sure. 
okay, so they can see whatever they see. Um, and I can't do much about that. And I can make the case the way I make the case in the way I do it and implement it. And then there's, there's an old um, line, I, I remember using this to introduce somebody or other, but I think it came from Gideon and somebody said it didn't come from Gideon, so then I said, this is one of your comments, should have come from Gideon. That what, what, what an architect does is there's a river, not the river sticks. Mm -hmm. Okay, but maybe it's the river sticks and it flowing out of the past into the future. This is the river. And, and the only thing an architect can do is drop something into that river. That's it. No more, no less. Mm -hmm. It sails, it sinks, it comes back. That's what you do. So you drop into the river and then let's see where it sails. Fine. Okay, but those are two different things. There's the, what no, is your work about- different than what you said. No, no. I For, agree with like, you. You and Peter, there are architects that are all about the, that river. And there and there are people like Wolf. I don't know how your conversation went with Wolf. Wolf believes- We didn't, we didn't do it. We're gonna try to do it, but we didn't do it so far. What happened? I don't know, he was arrested or something. <laughs> I don't know. Missed the plane, you know. Arrested development or? <laughs> yeah, no, he, he'll, Wolf, don't worry about Wolf, he's fine. Okay. Wolf is, uh, the two of you were the last two architects I came to want to know the work and are the two architects I've come to thank my lucky stars I came to know. But you're very different. You know, Wolf's conviction in the experience, in the existential consequence of the direct experience of the bi building on one person at a time is so paramount. It's hard to, it just seems almost silly. Say that again. He, you know, he believes that what the, fa the space feels like. When you go in, the experience of a building and, the, and the, what the ability of that, that to transform over time the ex existential milieu of a city is, that's, he believes it. And then, I mean, it, its relationship to his time in Vienna, right after Hitler and through, and because of the Baroque, uh, allegiance between the Baroque and the church and the Baroque and the imperial empire. I mean, Vienna is just a tough place for an architect to grow up. And Vienna in the late 60s must have just been hell. You know, when you, and when you realize for him to come through that, to be not taught history at all in school, to be taught that architecture was nothing but a technical enterprise, and to have to study history in a coffee club at night with Forstein, to have Holhein being the only person to act out and all that sort of stuff. I mean, so he really does believe that the building and the city is something that can make people feel free. And I don't really think he cares about the, his place, the place of his buildings in history. I mean, everybody does, but I, I honestly don't think so. Uh, whereas all the other friends I have. I don't know about that. I mean, this is an intro. I, I don't remember having that discussion quite in that way. I mean, he, he, I mean it's too bad he's not here. He's better at this than, than we are speaking for him. But, but there are always discussions about open as opposed to closed. Yeah, open. And, and the question is, is open an ideogram? In other words, what's open to which? Is it the building that's open? Or is it the inhabitant of the building which is opened as a consequence of the building? I don't know. I mean, I, I think there are, there are a lot of very optimistic possibilities yeah, in that seem. and then it might have something to do with if this is if this is a religious conversion and now you're open and that allows you to see what you didn't see before uh, it's definitely at a at a non-intellectual level whereas your architecture wants to work in partials i would say never to be decoded but to be working in partials at every at many levels 
intuitionally, affectively, intellectually, but always at, at many different, in, in, you know what I mean, in partials. That there's never some final unfolding of it, but there's a constant agitation, it may, an, an, an indeterminism, like a great poem. Like, you, there is never going to be an adjudication. Well, it's of like it. that little note, you never, you keep digging, you never get to the bottom. So if you could, if you could make something that was um, infinitely rewarding or inexhaustible, you know, like the light coming from the door of the law in Kafka, you know, the light shines from under the door and the light never goes out. You know? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, so that would be good. You guys got any questions? Let's do that. Build that. <laughs> okay, hang on. Uh, you. Yeah. Got any thoughts or comments? What's it like to sit there? I, I, it's, it's unfair to me because I like to know what it's like to sit there. Yeah, go ahead. Who are you talking um, to? Just whoever. I wanted to go back to the river. No, right here. Um, take me to the river. Yeah, take me to the river. Um, so I'm trying to get my head around the idea that whoever said that is talking about something that he's, what I'm seeing is not what he's not doing. Because if he's making that point that you drop a stick in the river and all you can do is float down it, well, he's. It wasn't a stick. Uh, it's a building. A building. I said the river oh. sticks. That's a river that oh, goes okay, to okay, hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, if you drop, you but if you drop, sorry, I should have someday. listened closer, but if you drop the building in the river and it floats down it, um, isn't he essentially saying that, uh, or, or he who says that is, uh, is not sort of floating, is not floating down like the river? It's like a pastoral metaphor. I don't know if it's no, no. any good. Do you know uh, Heraclitus? <laughs> I mean, do you know, have you ever heard that you can't put your foot in the same river twice? And you know why that is? Because it's moving. No, because it's already wet, because your foot's already wet. So if you put your foot in it once and it's wet, you can't, yeah. And then when they ride it on the subway wall in New York, they say, no, you can never even put your foot into the same river once. Yeah, I mean, no, it's already it's so, I mean, so don't forget about you gotta be careful about these river metaphors. I mean, first of all, <laughs> those were all fragments. And so you, you can sit around if you're a good writer and get those fragments and finish them out and you can make them really funny, you know. But, you know uh, the thing about the, riv the river of history, like, you, all you can do is make something, put it in a river which flows from the past and into the future. For me, don't you find that a form of oppression? <laughs> you know, like, I would just say, first of all, the Greeks imagined that, uh, the Greeks imagined that your face looked to history, which is all you could see, and the back of your head looked to the future. I don't know if you know this. So, so you're, the fact that you feel your face looking to the future and the back of your head looking to the past means that you even physiologically feel. I think you just. Do you worry about that? Does it? Does did the metaphor bother you? Is well, what I'm asking. Only because it gets to the point of, of the Orwell quote that he put up there that there's that there's um, there's saying something that is not It's he, Orwell, I swear to God, he was, he, he was a pretty good storyteller, but he sucked as a writer. And if you were a writer, if you were asked to me what was wrong with that quote is, I don't know a poem that has ever been put on trial, so I don't know a poem that's ever needed defending. I know poems that need interpreting. Yeah, but you're talking like, a, you know, a 19th century scientist. Me? Yeah, you just told us it doesn't have to be all true or completely I true know. in order to, to communicate something which is, which is useful. It contributes something useful. That's enough. It doesn't have to be 100% so, as we pointed out with Darwin and Newton and Freud and everybody else, I don't, Obama. It, it, it's not useful for me, for you, to teach students that I care about that it's not worth an effort to discuss it is. a poem. 
Yeah, but don't get nervous. That, don't get, that's the effect of Don't that get nervous. No, it isn't. This is, this is. I'm a, not nervous. Yeah. Well, you're getting worried that the students are going to miss out on the capacity to intellectualize, to debate, to manifestoize, to systematize an argument. I mean, in case you haven't been around any reviews here in the last couple of years, ain't no shortage of attempts to do that. I'm not okay, I don't that. remember too many students who stood up and said, it's a poem, hasta la vista, go figure it out. It actually, uh, you should protect the poetic side. I do. Not the, not the argument it, logic side. Uh, you know, it, I, I just, my, when I think they'll know, as soon as someone quotes somebody to me, I just say, so what? Like, Albert Einstein said so and so, I just say, so what? Who cares if that, like, is it right or not? Am I interested in the comment or not? Yeah, but that's the point. I mean, you look at it, you, if you can use it, you use it. If you want to think about it, you want to speculate about it, you do that. If it's not useful to you, throw it away. You know what happens? As you said, later on it may come back. And it might be useful in a frame of reference that you don't even anticipate. So this but, is okay. But that's, but that's why I'm asking you, that there must be some question. Like, why did you place, let's end on this, for, I mean, because I want them in this. You place intuition here, like you place it here. Intuition, the two things. Like, this is a fabulous question. Let something happen, you have no idea where it comes from, and then it's your responsibility to make it real. Those are the two parts of this discussion. Something bubbles up out of nowhere, and then you have to you have to figure out how to execute it. So, one of the things you well, first do, of all, I don't know whether it bubbled up out of nowhere, and you don't have to do anything. No, I'm saying this is what interests me. You, yeah, I'm, and I'm you, saying I mean, you, in order you that, that if you want to build it, I've always said, and I th I think Cyarch is about this. It's, well, it's why we did the gallery. You know, you, you tell students what to do, now you show students you can do that. Right. It's important. You yeah. want to talk about how students should build things? You build them. That's right. I, I think That's that, your job. Yes. Now, other people don't agree with no, you. No, I understand. Um, you know, to let something come to mind and then to listen to it, that's not, and first of all, it's not an easy discipline to learn. That's not an easy freedom to give yourself. You, so I think that's a fantastic, you're right about that. You know, you're mostly taught not to do that uh, or not. You have to trust yourself. Yeah, but you also have to feel some value in it. You have to, you, you're subject yeah. to the immediate comment that it's irresponsible and self-indulgent and the more public, yeah, but who, who cares, I know. I mean, uh, who said that? What, I mean, if somebody wants to make a case that it's whatever you said, it's self-indulgent or it's narcissistic or what, I, I mean, I don't know that any of that is intrinsically so or that any of these ideas wouldn't in a broader definitional sense deal with a whole series of banal and prosaic and operational and organizational questions all pursuant to making a building. So whether the instinct ruled the initial decisions or whether they didn't, wouldn't invalidate architecture interpreted in a, com in a much broader way. Uh, who, is anyone here about to graduate? I mean, are they, who, in, is anyone in their last year here? Okay, you are. Uh, so you feel like you have, both of you, you feel like you have lots of ways to think about architecture in, that you, you know how to think about architecture in, in ways that most people don't even know architecture can be thought about. Would that be fair as a consequence of your education? You, and that you have ways to think about how to make it. Okay. Do you think you have ways to uh, explain to people why it's worthwhile to do that? Walking these halls, and sorry, I can. I can. Um, and I don't know how you, how you put it in Well, in other words, let's say it, it'll happen that the more public you go and the more idiosyncratic your proposals are, the more, the more often you're going to hear, particularly in the world you're about to enter, that they're uh, self indulgent. 
I, I've just got through reading all the crit criticism of Wolf's building in, uh, and you'll re I'm writing a small piece for it in art form. Um, uh, uh, the building in the Musée de Confluence that's just opened in Lyon. And it's incredible how, whether it's in praise or in condemnation, how inept the commentary is. But my, all the negative commentary is on that, you know, it's an, it wants to be another Bill Bow, it's another piece of self-indulgent, this and that. I mean, just, you know, it, it, you know and so you're gonna face it. If any idiosync, the more idiosyncrasy, the more likelihood, you're not even gonna get the chance to answer the problem. But I mean, just be, and your but you client. But you have to decide, uh, what are you telling him? Are you telling no, I'm just him asking what, you, do you feel? But uh, all of this, all of this, I mean, there are, there are people who are arguing for, for uh, Santorum and Romney and all kinds of I know, but Wolf of has characters. A, Wolf so has why don't a, why don't you just tell him he needs to make an evaluation? He needs to decide what level of criticism is valid or no, but, argument, and let him go make the argument. No, and not worry about is, Wolf what, has a very clear sense of his project. When he's asked, he says it by a journalist. You can read. He responds, and when he's asked, he says it. Doesn't as the, jur the journalists never particularly or change their mind, but they put it in what he says. I mean, he knows at any level he's being discussed. As an expert level, he speaks in expert terms at a very at a public level, and so does Eric. I mean, they, they know how to discuss their work, but they know how to describe why the work matters to the world outside of their own selves. And I, and I wondered if you felt like at this school you had learned to. Th express your, the value of your thinking and your techniques also with that way. Wouldn't that be part of? Yeah, the, it should be, it's not, or very little. I mean, I, th I think students, students are used to describing work in a context, well, you've been involved with this, you have a lot to do with the definition of what's plausible, criteria for validating a project. You're part of that. Yeah, but the world the you're referring to and the kinds of criticism and evaluatory aspects of, of work is a very different world and presenting the content of a project in that world to that constituency different. is a hell of a lot different than it is to talk about work here. If the argument is that people should learn to make projects. You know, it's like we were talking the other day about, you remember we were talking about the HR guy and the HR guy, the SC and the business school and all of that stuff and that, that he was, this was a guy that we were looking at, at hiring for, for uh, a staff position and among other achievements in his uh, career. He was working at the dental school at USC with a lot of dentists or upcoming dentists who were great at dentistry but didn't know how to, to open an office and write a contract and, and talk to clients and things like that. And, and we got into a discussion about whether or not Cyarch, it's, it's, it's a little bit the sort of pro-practice discussion. Nakazawa was good at that, oh, yeah. and yeah. Nakazawa was super good at that, and whether, I mean, this is a, a little bit different discussion, whether Sayark puts students in a position to talk in a more pragmatic, prosaic, ban banal about subjects that are not really the essence of the subject as they define it internally, but might very well be the essence of a subject as the world would define it externally, and to what extent do you pay attention to those subjects when you're presenting a project? And do we do that? And the answer is we probably could do better, and we don't do much of that. Well, all, uh, in, in closing, all I just wanted to say was for you to put this as the third of our talks is to put something on the table that I think is incredibly, not risky, but incredibly, I don't know what the word is. It honors the students and the school in a way I just wanted to point out. And that is, it's one thing for us to know a whole lot of uh, counterintuitive projects of architecture that we, know are, that we know have been thought about, worked out, you know, why architecture sh could effectively improve a certain situation by not responding to the context. 
for example. So we've, we know that. We know that we know when to respond to the context. We know when not to respond to the context. We know how to do both. We know when, it, when a context, we know when it's a precinct. We know all sorts of ways because these intuitive, I mean, we know traditional ways and we know ca counter traditional ways. But when you come and talk to these students and say, listen, there's one more piece of your education I'm gonna tell you right before you leave, and it's gonna be important in your life, uh, and that is, there, you have a, there's a likelihood that a lot of your work is gonna be driven by intuition, or some of your work is gonna be driven by intuition, and there's not, not only are you not gonna be able to explain it to anyone else, you're not even gonna be able to explain it to yourself. You don't know why it's important yet. I, I think that's quite a powerful thing to say as a teacher. And I think to simply say that it's proven its value instrumentally in over time, again and again, doesn't really, I mean, I guess all I can say is just never tell anybody. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you guys.